Okay, so as the numbers are climbing, I will introduce myself and, and, and introduce Dimitri. We're very delighted um, to kick off our sequence of spring seminars at the Qatar Centre for Global Banking and Finance, kicking it off with a wonderful speaker, Professor Dimitri Vianos. Um, the Qatar Centre focuses its work on the interplay between financial markets, central banks and other policymakers. And Dimitri has all of these bases covered. From a theoretical perspective, uh, his extensive work on liquidity and arbitrage confirms his eminence. And he's leavened with significant work also on the formation and dynamics of beliefs. From an applied perspective, uh, his work typically comes with useful policy insights, even the theoretical work, but also his involvement in development of reform, the Greek economy, financial markets more generally, really marks him out. Perhaps most relevantly, uh, given what he's presenting today, uh, Dimitri's works provide some theoretical justification of how large-scale asset purchases and or directed purchases at different maturities um, um, might work. Uh, ben Bernanke, I think it was, who said, uh, QE works in practice, but not in theory. Uh, though if you look hard enough in Fed speeches from around that time, you'll probably see a reference to Vianus Villa. So as I say, we're delighted to have Dimitri speaking today. Um, he'll speak for about 50 minutes, uh, leaving some time at the end for questions. However, if your questions are, you know, can't wait, uh, type it in the Q&A, that's not the chat section, the Q&A section, and I'll try to bring it to Dimitri's attention as we go through. Um, so with that, Dimitri, over to you. We're, we're delighted to have you. Thank you so much, um, Rhys, for your um, kind introduction. So this is a um, um, joint work with um, Pierre-Olivier Gouvenchard at uh, Berkeley and uh, now at uh, the, the IMF as a chief economist, uh, and uh, Walker Ray, my colleague at the LSE. So a preferred habitat model of term premia, exchange rate, and monetary policy spillovers. Let me give um, some motivating um, uh, introduction to what we're doing. So the big question that uh, kind of will be underlying the um, talk is how does monetary policy both conventional and unconventional, transmit domestically and internationally. So if we think about the um, basic kind of off-the-shelf open, open economy macro model, there is a little role for a time-varying risk premium. So they're taking either to be zero or to be constant um, in the first order. So the um, uncovered interest parity holds uh, in the currency market and the expectations hypothesis holds in the bond market. So um, what this implies for the transmission of a monetary policy, expectations hypothesis implies that the yield curve in each country is controlled by the local uh, short rate, the short rate in that country and the expectations about what this rate will be in the future. And uh, what UIP implies is that if there is any, any deviation between policy rates across the two countries, this is absorbed by the exchange rate, so um, which sometimes is referred to as the Man Mandelian insulation. Somehow the exchange rate insulates uh, one country from uh, monetary policy uh, developments in the other. Now, uh, moreover, uh, unconventional policy, such as uh, QE, has no effect. Now, the um, kind of coming from the finance side, what um, what kind of the finance literature has uh, uh, done kind of quite extensively is that it has documented that the risk premia vary um, quite a lot, both in uh, bond markets. This is since the work on of Fama and Bliss, kind of shown that the um, the um, risk premium of long, uh, I mean expected returns of long relative to short term bonds um, are positively related uh, to the slope of the term structure, and uh, also. Uh, they vary in um, currency markets, so there is this uh, UIP puzzle that um, on average uh, currencies that have a higher interest rates uh, have a, a higher um, the, the kind of going long these currencies and the shorter the currencies with low interest rates has a higher has a high excess return. So uh, there has been like tons of work on these uh, topics, but somehow a bit disconnected from the um, the basic kind of macro. Uh, model in an open economy setting. So more recently also, more interesting facts on the coming from the finance side is that the risk premia in the currency and the bond markets are, are connected. For example, um, um, Lloyd and Marine and Chernoff and Creel show that um, the um, uh, kind of UIP, the, the violations of the UIP can be predicted uh, based also on the difference in slope of the term structures between home and foreign. So, um, so this is kind of, let's say, from the finance side, the um, um, 
problems that the um, open economy macro model would um, the challenge to, the, to that model. And also from the from the kind of more kind of macro side, the policy side is that the unconventional monetary policy uh, seems to have had the effects uh, on yields, uh, as has been documented quite extensively through this um, kind of portfolio balance channel, and also on um, uh, for on the currency market. For example, um, when um, the kind of there is evidence, uh, for instance, that when uh, the ECB uh, did um, through its QE program, uh, the euro uh, depreciated relative to the dollar, and it's like it's like similar evidence for uh, in the U.S. So, all right. So the goal is to try to kind of build this, um, incorporate these considerations in the um, into the kind of open economy uh, macro setting and um, think about the transmission of um, uh, policy. Now, let me talk also a little bit about the theory kind of side, how the kind of modeling has tried to kind of keep up with this um, thinking and facts. So um, there have been several papers that have tried to um, uh, develop representative agent models, reconciling, kind of trying to explain this behavior and risk premia. They have explained some things, but more difficult to explain others. The, um, and a different path has been uh, taken by some uh, authors by um, trying to introduce financial intermediaries in um, uh, kind of uh, uh, currency markets. So trying to think about um, uh, some notion of segmentation, uh, let's say across the, two, the, invest, the households in, the, in uh, let's say two countries and some arbitrageurs who can um, in, have kind of better access into investment opportunities in, in uh, kind of across, the, across both countries. So there is some sense, there's a general sense in the literature uh, that uh, some limits to arbitrage, kind of some notion of this, uh, that we need to introduce arbitrageurs with some frictions is, is important for explaining the, the behavior of um, exchange rates. And this comes back to this uh, old literature on portfolio balance, uh, starting with uh, Curry. So what we're going to do in this paper is we're going to um, develop kind of built on, this, on these ideas. So we're going to introduce risk averse arbitrageurs who are um, going to invest in currency markets and also in uh, fixed income markets. And um, we are going to think about what this implies about the um, uh, kind of the behavior of risk premia and about the transmission of a, a monetary policy. So um, this builds a kind of the, the formal setting that I will show you on my work with Villa that um, also Rhys uh, mentioned on the preferred habitat, which is kind of a pure kind of closed economy uh, term structure uh, model. So essentially we're going to have two countries in this uh, like, that, like that, plus look at the, uh, uh, not kind of seek the, look at the connections between their bond markets and their and the currency market. And there is also this related work by uh, Greenwood, um, uh, Hanson, uh, uh, Sunderan and uh, Stein. In uh, that do some kind of in discrete time with two um, um, two bonds, kind of just short and long. So, all right. So the I will show you. I will obviously the findings in more detail. But the summary is that um, I would uh, this our model will um, speak to many of the empirical facts that um, I, I mentioned before about the behavior of bond and currency risk premium. We will do this um, kind of quantitatively. But also, we're going. I will show you the results of the calibration where we try to get at some magnitudes and um, kind of match some moments and see the behavior. What the model tells us about other moments. So um, the um, I will show you that the monetary policy shocks are transmitted um, kind of um, internationally and. Um, kind of a general message that comes out of a general theme that comes out of many of our results is that. Um, uh, this um, notion of insulation, Mandelian insulation, does not quite work in, in the world that I will present to you. So the um, kind of the, the fact that the exchange rate is floating does not um, mean that the country is insulated from monetary developments in the other country. So QE in um, let's say in the uh, in the US is going to affect the. Um, exchange rate uh, between the dollar and the pound, between the dollar and the euro, et cetera, for example. Okay, so let me go straight into the model. All right, so we have uh, two countries, home and foreign, 
So the exchange rate ET is going to be the um, price of the foreign currency in terms of the home currency. So when ET goes up, means that foreign currency becomes more expensive relative to home. So it means the home currency depreciates. So kind of a key, uh, our goal in our work is to integrate and um, kind of study jointly the behavior of exchange rates and the interest rates and bond prices. So we're going to have also um, uh, conti uh, continuum of zero coupon bonds in each uh, country, home and foreign. Let's, we can ask, we're going to assume that these bonds are in zero net supply up to maturity capital T. We denote by P, J, T, tau here, the uh, price of a um, bond with maturity tau in country J at time T. And we, de uh, we define, we denote the yield to maturity by Y. We take the um, short rate, sometimes we refer to it as a policy rate in each country um, to be exogenous. And um, effectively our goal is to understand how movements in the um, short rates are reflected into the endogenous um, bond prices and the exchange rate. Okay, so in uh, line with this kind of uh, motivating um, uh, talk that I gave before, we're going to think about the uh, kind of this re behavior, this re description of the participants in the in the in the various um, markets as having some segmentation, and um, these markets bridged by a limited set of arbitrageurs. So arbitrageurs, uh, the last agents in my description here, they can trade both currencies. And they can train also the bonds of both countries and all maturities. Now, additionally to arbitrageurs, there will be some investors who are going to be trading bonds in count at home and the home country, some investors who are going to be trading bonds in the foreign country, and some investors who are going to be trading currency. And we're going to think about these three, these uh, other investors, I mean, currency traders and the, the preferred habitat bond investors in each country as being kind of a separate, separate set of kind of segmented investors. Okay, arbitrageurs are the easiest kind of ones to kind of motivate and maybe think in, in our formal in our setting. Kind of the more they are more the most kind of conventional agents in a sense. So they um, have a wealth WT. We take the home currency to be the numerator and assume that the, this is the safe asset for arbitrageurs. This this really does not entail much of uh, in terms of loss of generality. So we denote by WFT the um, wealth that arbitrageurs invest in country F. We denote by X, J, T, Tau, how much uh, um, is worth the position of arbitrageurs in the um, bond of country J and maturity Tau. Of course, this, uh, this um, both WFT and X, J, Tau will be, uh, X, J, T, Tau will be endogenous, will be determined by the optim optimization by arbitrageurs, which is just described here. So we give arbitrageurs for simplicity a mean variance objective. So they care about the expected re return and variance of their return over the next instant. And okay, let's spend a little bit of time on the evolution, the dynamics of their wealth. So um, the, um, okay, so there is, um, their wealth grows, grows at the short rate in country, uh, in the home country, which is their kind of, um, the risk associated for them. The, so now, in addition to that, they can increase that return, the kind of the, this basic safe riskless return through three, three different types of investments. They can invest um, uh, in the foreign currency. They invest WFT in the foreign country. So think of it for, for, for a minute as, being, as if that wealth were invested all of it in the, for, in the foreign currency, just in the, in the I mean, just in the, um, in in the short rate in the foreign country, so then they would they would get the return of the currency carry trade, which is the short rate differential between home and foreign, plus any appreciation of the foreign um, currency. Additionally to that, they can invest in home bonds, and this is the excess return of um, uh, the home bond with maturity tau over the home short rate. And additionally to that, they can invest in the um, some of the wealth that they invest in the foreign country, instead of putting it in the foreign short rate, they can put it in the foreign uh, long-term bonds. 
So, and this is the return that they can get from that, the last parenthesis. This is kind of whatever foreign bonds would pay them in excess of the foreign short rate. So, um, all right. And arbitrageurs will be opportunistic. They will invest, they will, each of, they will do each of these trades uh, to the extent that these trades offer a kind of high expected returns. Now, in addition to the arbitrageurs, there are these other investors, the segmented investors, for whom we're going to take a more reduced form in our modeling. So we'll give them some kind of demand function. We'll say that there is a, uh, so the preferred habitat investors, sorry, um, uh, in, um, for, um, in country J, in the bond market of country J. Uh, so the demand, the bond with maturity tau, and they, they, their demand is, um, we allow it to be log linear in the, in the price. So it's uh, decreasing in the logarithm of the bond price. It also depends on this uh, factor. This we kind of we allow kind of a stochastic shifter to that uh, demand. Sometimes these investors want to uh, hold more bonds, sometimes less bonds. This can incorporate, by the way, uh, purchases by uh, the central bank in the country J. This can be into this beta uh, JT. Uh, likewise, the currency traders we allow them to um, demand some uh, foreign currency, and uh, their demand for foreign currency to be uh, a decreasing function of the log real exchange rate. So if um, foreign currency becomes more expensive, then um, they demand less of it. They also give their, they allow them kind of allow for a demand shifter for foreign car, um, car, demand for foreign currency, this gamma factor. These elasticities, if you don't like them, we can just set them to zero. Of course, they will play the important role, these elasticities. I mean, whether it's zero or whether it's positive, this alpha E and the alpha J. Okay, and we are, ah, we take inflation rates to be exogenous and constant. So this is not going to be a full fledged macro model. We, um, our goal will be to determine endogenously the exchange rate and the um, uh, bond prices as a function of these uh, primitives, which include the inflation rates and kind of the, the, the shape of these demand functions. All right, so uh, finally, last slide on the model market clearing in each market. So demand for home bonds from arbitrageurs and from preferred habitat investors equal to the net supply, which is zero. Zero net supply is not a restrictive assumption. We can just fold in there, fold into the Z any uh, sub kind of amount of bonds issued by the um, treasury in, country, in the home country. Same for foreign bonds and same for the currency markets. All right, that's it, that's the model. Let me next. Yeah, um, sorry, uh, fine, sorry. Uh, I forgot to say one thing, uh, sorry. The, okay, so these are the, we just allow some general dynamics for our factors. This is, these are just our factors and we're just putting them together, what, what I told you before. The short rates for home and foreign, the demands, the, these demand shifters for home and foreign and the currency demand. We can just have a, a vector of these factors and allow for some general dynamics for this uh, vector of, uh, of factors, okay. So let's go to um, some simple cases. So the first simple case, and this is kind of the standard case in a sense, is when the arbitrageurs are is neutral. Then expectations hypothesis holds in the, in the equilibrium of our model. So the um, expected return, instantaneous expected return of, the, of a home uh, bond is equal to the home short rate. Same for foreign. Therefore, um, corollary of that, as I said in my first uh, slide, the um, home yield curve does not depend on um, uh, what happens in the short rate or in the foreign to the foreign short rate, does not depend on QE, just depends on the current uh, home short rate and uh, the expectations about this uh, home short rate in the future. UIP holds as well. So um, the um, rate of, um, of uh, depreciation of the home currency is equal to the home uh, foreign short rate differential. And this is the Mandelian insulation result. Okay, so- um, Excuse me, Dimitri. Yes, no, of course. Quickly, we, have, we have a question asking about, um, you know, with regards to regulation of financial markets, how does the lack of capital that one might need to arbitrage away anomalies, how is that going to affect the market prices and the economies? Okay. Um, very good. Thank you. Thanks for this question. 
So what are the, effectively this, uh, how can we, uh, what represent here these frictions? Well, it's going to be represented by this coefficient A. So A is the risk aversion of arbitrageurs. So we don't um, kind of impose any explicit constraint on the capital that arbitrageurs can invest in their trades. We capture these constraints in a somewhat reduced form through A. So if A is very large, arbitrageurs would be able to do only very small trades because they would be very risk averse. So you can think kind of in a reduced form as in terms of the variation to that uh, kind of level of capital that is available to um, take this kind of these arbitrage positions as being variation in A. All right, so, um, okay, so we talked about the, this benchmark. So here actually is the case where there is not any constraint in that capital. A, arbitrageurs have essentially infinite capital, so they can, uh, they are um, risk neutral. So now, we're, from now on, we're going to assume that they're risk averse, which effectively means that there is some uh, constraint uh, in the capital that they, they can invest. All right, so we're going to um, focus for much of the remaining of the talk on the case where there are no demand um, shocks. So these shifters, beta and gamma, I will set them to zero, these demand shifters for bonds and currency. And um, we'll take a very simple form for the um, short trade process to be this mean reverting process in each country. Short trades mean revert to, a, to a, some longer than mean I, I bar J. This should be a T here, apologies for that. It's not R. And um, the, uh, we're going to take, take them even to be independent across the two countries. So there we can establish analytical results and kind of get very uh, clear intuitions about what's happening in the model. So now, in the interest of even kind of drilling to the very, very simple intuitions, we're going to, I will start from um, the case where <coughs> uh, the, um, what the kind of the fully segmented case, let's assume that instead of having one set of arbitrageurs, uh, as I described before, we have three sets of arbitrageurs who are completely dis disjoint. There are some arbitrageurs that are um, kind of trading in the currency market, some that are trading in the home bond market, some are trading in the foreign bond market. So this is just for, let's say, pedagogical reasons. Then I will come to the in more interesting case, which is really what we want to focus on, which is there is one set of arbitrageurs who can do all three trades. Now, so in the segmented case, there are the following uh, segmented arbitrage cases, there are the following things that are happening. So this is, um, first of all, how um, um, shocks to the um, to short rates are transmitted to the um, uh, to the exchange rate. <clears throat> so we can write the kind of exchange rate has the uh, is a linear the log exchange rate is a linear function of the short rates and of the various assumptions in the model give us this simple equilibrium characterization for the exchange rate. So an important property here is the second bullet point uh, in the proposition that says that um, the currency, the expected return of the currency carry trade depends, is not a constant, is not zero, and uh, depends on the short rates at home and foreign. In particular, it increases in the foreign short trade and it decreases in the home short trade. So we get these predictable UIP deviations in the, in the, consistent with the empirical evidence. Uh, currency carry trades are more profitable for high, I mean, are profitable, essentially going long the high interest rate currencies. Now, what's the intuition here? The, and this follows um, kind of the logic of Curie and Cabex and Maggiore. So, so here it's not really new so far, but I, I have to present it because this builds the kind of subsequent intuition. So when, let's say that there's an increase in the foreign short rate. So this means that uh, now arbitrageurs, they see the foreign short rate go, 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 going up. So, um, they would say, huh, okay, so it's uh, good for us to um, invest in the currency carry trade. So they will try to uh, kind of buy more of the foreign currency. Now, as long as the uh, currency traders have a price elastic demand, the foreign currency is going to appreciate. Sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, and the foreign currency is going to appreciate. As long as they have a price elastic demand, they are going to reduce their holdings. They will hold less foreign currency, and the arbitration are going to find themselves holding, holding more foreign currency. Therefore, Arbitrageurs being risk averse and holding more foreign currency, they will, um, they, I mean, they will want as compensation a, a higher <laughs> return of the currency carry trade. So in equilibrium, as, as part of the process of arbitrageurs kind of uh, buying more foreign currency to uh, 
uh, take uh, to exploit the increase in the foreign short trade, the the equilibrium consequence is that the, the expected return of the currency carry trade has to increase. Otherwise, arbitrageurs will not be uh, getting into this transaction in the first place. Another Ooh. question, Dimitri, if I, yes. if I may. Um, perhaps this actually relates to the reduced form way that um, the friction zones are embedded. But somebody's asking about whether or not you can speak to the violations of covered interest rate parity um, at all. Fine. Yeah, thank you. So uh, now, um, in our model, uh, uh, one second. Okay, I have to go to the to the um, to the um, uh, model with global arbitrageurs. In that model, I will, the, uh, which will be our main model. Uh, so in that model, the uh, cover interest rate parity is going to hold because, uh, well, arbitrageurs may be risk averse, but uh, if there is a risk free, if there is a kind of a free lunch, a risk free arbitrage, they are going to uh, to go to to eliminate it, it the, by uh, their risk aversion kind of essentially prevent uh, limits how much risk they can take but this is a risk this is a risk less arbitrage in our model so car so cip is going to hold you know in 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 our in the global kind of arbitrage version of what i would of what i'm showing you now uh, now we can talk maybe about this at the in the q a if you like kind of we have some ideas about kind of extending this model uh, through more frictions in, uh, in uh, for arbitrageurs to uh, make kind of to generate uh, CIP and also kind of connect it to some of the other phenomena that we I will derive, but but uh, not in what I will show you in the main presentation. All right, now let's keep going with uh, segmented arbitrage, and uh, I, I said what happens in the in the currency market with the behavior of the currency carry trade. Uh, uh, now let's talk about bond markets. So if now. Um, okay, so in the bond market, also we're going to find some uh, violations of the expectations um, hypothesis, and in particular, the um, there will be this uh, link between um, uh, the slope of the term structure and um, the uh, bond risk premium, expe excess, expect expected excess returns for long term relative to short term bonds. How does this work? This is the logic of uh, uh, my paper with Villa in the clo closed economy. Let's go through it again. So if, uh, let's say, um, so, um, the short rate in country J goes down. So um, arbitrageurs now, what they would like to do is that they would like to borrow short and uh, buy bonds in that in country J, buy long-term bonds. So because, uh, because it's, uh, now it's cheaper to borrow short. Now, th this will tend to push bond prices up. And uh, as bond prices go up, as long as the, the, the preferred habitat investor supplies price elastic, they will reduce their holdings of bonds. So arbitrageurs will find themselves holding more bonds and being more exposed to um, interest rates uh, uh, going up. Therefore, this will, in equilibrium, this means that the ex um, expected excess return of long-term bonds relative to short-term bonds has to go up. Okay. So um, for arbitrage, for this all this thing to happen and arbitrageurs to be willing to hold these bigger positions. So, so means that uh, we we have a term structure now that is becoming more more steeply slow because the short rate has gone down. Expected excess returns of long term bonds, short term bonds, has gone up. All right. So um, so we find these kind of two key um, responses of um, in the, in the currency market and in the bond market. These responses, by the way, imply some underreaction of uh, bond prices and um, and the uh, and the exchange rate to the short rates. Precisely because arbitrageurs do not get fully into these trades because they are concerned about how much risk they are holding, they don't fully transmit the shocks um, of the, the short rate shocks to the exchange rate or to bond prices. One more thing, Le, let's uh, talk about the um, quantity kind of uh, side. So let's say that um, there is an increase in bond demand in country J. Let's say a QE shock. So uh, this is going to reduce yields in country J just because kind of the portfolio balance essentially arbitrageurs. Uh, holdings are changing, and this affects um, um, how they price the rest of the term structure, but has no effect, very importantly, on the exchange rate or on um, uh, bond yields in the other country. So, and the same conclusion applies if we have a, a shock to the demand for foreign currency. This affects only the currency market, not bond yields. So, the, and of how to think about it, how to uh, kind of connect to the big picture in the introduction about the uh, transmission. 
So here we have a full insulation result that the changes in the home monetary conditions, whether it's conventional policy or QE, do not affect the foreign yield curve as long as the foreign short rate does not change. So there is a full insulation. However, this is this is this happens because we have this segmented set of arbitrageurs. This result is going to disappear. Uh, yeah, and not because we have the, the, the floating exchange rates. This in then what I will show you next, we're going to have these global arbitrageurs who trade in all markets, and there will there will be some transmission, there will not be full insulation, despite having the, the floating exchange rate. All right, so let's let's go to the global arbitrage. So now, as I kind of pre-announced, there will be one set of arbitrageurs trading bonds, home at foreign, and the uh, trading currencies. All right. So now let's go again through, um, let's say, a decline in the home short rate. And what I will show you now is that this will imply uh, not only an effect in the home um, kind of uh, in the home yields and um, uh, in fact in the currency market, but also a change in uh, in the foreign term structure. Okay, so um, let's build on the logic of the segmented arbitrage that I described before. So now, when so home, short, home short rate goes down, arbitrageurs uh, say, okay, now uh, we're going to buy more uh, home bonds. We're going to borrow kind of short at home and buy uh, home bonds. We're also going to um, um, invest more in the foreign uh, in the currency carry trade, kind of buy more of the invest more in the foreign um, um, car, uh, currency. Now, what does this imply for their um, e exposure for their risk exposure? So now they are of, of, they are they are going to be more exposed through the foreign currency position to a um, uh, decline in the foreign short rate. Of course, there is some exposure that they have in the in the home short trade that we already described before, and it's because of this exposure that the risk premium varies the way I described before. But now, also, the these arbitrageurs have to think about their exposure in the for, in the in the for, to the foreign short trade, and then, more importantly, because they are global arbitrageurs, they can try to hedge that exposure with foreign bonds. So, arbit, their currency position of arbitrageurs makes them exposed to the risk that the foreign short trade will go down. A good hedge for that is foreign bonds. Because they, if this foreign short trade goes down, the price of foreign bonds goes up. So therefore, they are going to buy more uh, foreign bonds, which will mean that foreign yields are going to decline. Okay. So which, so this means that there is this transmission from the easing of monetary conditions at home to foreign to the kind of decline of uh, yields at foreign, even though the foreign short trade stays constant. So there's this transmission through the, through the risk premium. Now let's. Build a little bit more on that. I mean, essentially, this is one of our key mechanisms. So, um, Reese, if there are any kind of clarifying questions, I would be very happy to answer them. Let me build a little bit on that uh, on that transmission to um, talk about QE. We we have a we have a question, not directly on that, but but about what happens if we have a a, a currency uh, being pegged by a, by a monetary agency. Um, Sorry, currency what? Currency being paid, a, fi a fixed fixed exchange rate being 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 set. Oh, I see. So, uh, all right. So if okay, so if we're in a world of a f with fixed exchange rates, then um, uh, well, then interest short rates in the two countries, I think they there they have to be um, um, set set equal effectively. So um, now. Um, that's right. So, so there there would be kind of, yeah, yeah. With fixed exchange rates, there would be this trans, this kind of, hard, kind of let's say hardwired transmission of a, of a monetary conditions from one country to another. I mean, the question that I this was what I want to emphasize is that even if interest rates are floating, there is there can there is some transmission here. So yes, but uh, yeah, with fixed of course, and then one can also study the. Uh, perhaps the intermediate and the more real realistic in some cases uh, situation where there is some um, kind of pegged exchange rate or there's some, there's some kind of room for variation of exchange rates and we're with between fixed and floating. But in the world of fixed, yes, then, then there is um, interest rates are equal. All right. Um, now let me, okay, let's stick now with this, um, with the floating rates and let's, let's, let's uh, go to a thing about transmission of QE from one country to another. All right. So let's say there is a QE in country J, 
And uh, as we already talked in the segmented arbitrage case, this reduces yields in country J. This is now is going to reduce yields also in the other country. So there will be transmission of QE across countries, and it's going to depreciate the country in uh, the, I mean the currency of country J. So let's go through the logic of that. So, so when the when the uh, in response to QE in country J, the bond purchases by the central bank, arbitrageurs are going to reduce their position to accommodate the increase in demand. And let's think of the extreme case where they go short in country in the bonds of country J, just for the for intuition. Now, go short bonds in country J. This means that they are exposed to the risk that the short rate in country J will go down. How do they hedge the risk that the short rate in country J uh, goes down? Where well, they are going to buy um, to, uh, to to go long in the currency of the other country because it appreciates when the, the currency of country J goes down. Okay, so so what does this imply? This implies a depreciation of the of the currency in country uh, J. Furthermore, by the mechanism that I described in the previous slide, when arbitrageurs have a long position in the um, uh, currency of country uh, in the in, a, in the currency of the other country, not country J, they're going to hedge this position by investing in the other country's bonds. So therefore, a, a pressure. To, um, on, on the yields of the other countries' uh, bonds to go down. So the, the, the transmission of QE internationally. And there is a similar kind of logic that um, or kind of on how, uh, let's say, sterilized intervention work, works. So the, uh, let's say, the uh, uh, increase in, um, uh, let's say, there is a purchase of a foreign currency that holding short rates in the two countries fixed. This is going to uh, uh, lower bond yields at home and um, even though home short rates are not changing and increase them in in foreign so there is this uh, um, trans transmission of the sterilized intervention to a uh, bond yields through the changes in risk premia by the same logic so these are really the key mechanisms in the model now um, okay and uh, <clears throat> Kind of uh, coming back to the installation question, this shows that even when floating uh, inter exchange rates are fully floating, there is this transmission uh, of, of um, po mo both conventional monetary policy internationally and the uh, QE through the risk premium. Okay, so now I have uh, yeah a bit about ten minutes. So what I would like to do is I would like to go to the um, talk talk about the general case. So far I have talked about the. Um, Simple case when I have a, I, where I have shut down the demand factors, and um, I have assumed independent short rates between the two countries. I will show you how one can go through the full model and show you some calibration results. How can how one can try to go about kind of quantifying some of these mechanisms? All right, so we have these five factors: that the short rates and the demand factors, the home and foreign demand, bond demand, home and foreign, and the currency demand. We can um, we have a we can we the model has a solution and a fine solution for um, the log bond prices and log exchange rates as the as linear functions of I mean a fine function of the, of, the, of these factors. All right, so we're going to solve for these um, 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 parameters of these affine functions. I mean, it boils down to solving um, um, in general a, a scalar system of equations. But we want to, um, okay, so to, and we're going to do, we can only do this numerically because they are, unlike what I showed you before, we have more equations. So it's not as easy to kind of prove uh, the analytical results. So we're going to um, make assumptions about um, kind of the form of the demand function for, um, for bonds, for currency, um, and the kind of about the correlation between the two factors, the, the various factors. So we're going to assume that um, the, um, the factors are independent. We're just going to allow for correlation between home and foreign short rates. This, uh, this is observable, so it's easy kind of to, to get a handle of what it is. We're going to assume, on the, on the other hand, that the demand shifters are independent across bonds and the currencies. And um, also, in terms of the, this dynamics of the, this gamma matrix, the feedbacks, we're going to allow for um, uh, only for feedback between the um, short rates to the um, currency demand. 
will play some role, uh, kind of capture some important aspect of the data that I can talk about later. Um, now, okay, so how do we estimate uh, this? Uh, so by doing all this, we have already reduced quite a bit the parameters we have to estimate. So kind of, and get kind of got closer to, still to a model that is reasonably kind of simple and um, um, kind of more parsimonious, but still we have to estimate um, a number of parameters. So it's about 15 parameters or so. And um, we are using a bunch of second moments for um, short rates, changes in short rates, um, some um, uh, long rates, uh, kind of, uh, again, uh, long uh, variance of long rate of long yields, uh, changes in long yields, their correlations with uh, correlations in changes with short yield. And um, so here is how the, um, okay, so how the model would fit fits. So, the um, the circles are the um, the, what, the the moments in the data, and um, these are the moments we're trying to hit with uh, by 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 setting our fifteen parameters or so, and um, so the, you can see the model kind of gets quite close to some of these uh, data moments. So in some cases, the kind of there are these uh, wiggles that the model generates, but the, so these are the volatilities of yields, um, kind of the um, and the yield changes. And uh, okay, so um, all right now, but but overall, kind of it it fits the, them quite well. Now, what I will tell you now how the model fits some untargeted moments, <clears throat> and some of these moments concern the uh, um, this this um, kind of the bond market, this uh, return predictability regressions for bonds, so the Feynman Bliss and Campbell Shiller regressions that essentially predict. Um, excess returns for long-term over short-term bonds using the slope of the term structure. And then also I will show you some currency moments. So these are the, the, bond, mar the bond predictability moments. So this is, um, okay, what we are getting kind of the basics right in the sense of uh, predicting a positive, <coughs> a positive relationship between term structure slope and bond risk premium. This, um, in the data, this relationship becomes stronger. The coefficient increases with maturity. So this we don't get right. We get an approximately flat coefficient. But okay, at least uh, kind of there is this, uh, we, we are within confidence intervals and certainly there is this uh, um, kind of significant uh, predictability. It's, it's statistical kind of, we, okay, the kind of the average, its average um, is the same as in the data. Now, in terms of the currency moments, so um, we kind of, okay, the, we, there is this profitability, profitability of the currency uh, carry trade that decreases if one does this uh, currency carry trade with long maturity bonds. And also the, on, of if, we, if one does, um, looks at the long horizon UIP, so whether long rates predict long-term changes in exchange rates, the U long horizon UIP holds better on average. So these things we get reasonably close to the empirical moments. And another moment that is interesting is um, that we get kind of the big kind of the, the, the basics, right? Although not as close quantitatively as uh, we would like is the, uh, this um, predicting kind of currency carry trade returns using the slope differential of the, the slope differentials of the two countries. I told you that this, this if um, so the slope differentials between common foreign can pr uh, predict the currency carry trade return. There is some, um, so we get to, this is very consistent with the logic of the model. And um, we, we get to that now. Okay, final thing. I want to show you some um, policy experiments. Okay, so yeah. So on. Um, so we're going to do two main experiments. First of all, a policy, a conventional policy shock. So a decline, a 25 basis points decline in the policy rate. We'll give this a half life of one year, and then a QE shock. Um, a demand shock that represents for for bonds at home or foreign that represents about ten percent of GDP. So, um, and here we give it a longer half life of seven years, kind of to mimic a bit some uh, kind of the QE ex experience. Now, the um, for the risk aversion, actually, is this a moment that is um, is important, of course, in our model, and uh, is not a very Easy moment to calibrate based on. I mean, we cannot really disentangle it from some other moments based on the um, 
sorry, we cannot disentangle it based on some on some other model parameters. This is a parameter, it's not a moment. This is, we cannot disentangle it from some other parameters uh, using the second moments that I showed you earlier, because um, let's say yields can be very volatile if arbitrageurs are risk averse, or if demand is very, or by preferred habitat investors is, is volatile. So it's, we cannot really disentangle the, the two, risk aversion from the other. So for risk aversion, we have to essentially make some assumptions about what we think is a plausible CRRA coefficient, the gamma for um, for kind of arbitrageurs in general, and, and also how much wealth do we think arbitrageurs plausibly control? So, it, so we are going to talk about two different values of A based on arbitrageurs controlling um, uh, five wealth of five percent of um, US GDP or twenty percent of US GDP. These are kind of two extremes based on how how many people do we want to classify as, as these global arbitrageurs. And okay, so let me show you here. We'll show you two um, two sets of, of slides for conventional policy and QE. So this is the conventional policy slide. So um, what you see here is that okay. So first of all, there is the response. The, the, so this is the home um, response to the home short rate um, shock. Of, not surprisingly, the home um, yield curve is going to um, go down, and um, especially kind of for short maturities, given the shock is going to be mean reverting, has a half life of one year. The um, spillover to the foreign um, um, term structure is almost zero; is negligible. And uh, this is a fairly robust result that we, we find quantitatively. So in some sense, in contrast of what I told you in the uh, um, in the kind of in, in the previous section, in the kind of, kind of more the analytical results, kind of we even though it arises, it's small. And this is we partially because there is the correlation between the short rates at home and foreign, um, which we assume independent in the to be independent in the in the analytical part, plays an important role. It somehow reduces this hedging that arbitrageurs. Uh, do when they um, uh, kind of the, the, that they want to buy for um, foreign bonds to um, hedge kind of the uh, um, their their currency position. So anyway, so there is a effect on the currency market. It's more smaller than the under UIP. Now with QE, by contrast, and uh, so here this is the effect for risk aversion is equal to ten. The low risk aversion. Let's talk about the high risk aversion. So. Um, the effect is about um, 50 basis points for, um, and by contrast of what I was showing you for the conventional policy, the uh, uh, effects of QE are quite similar at home and foreign. So in other words, the transmission of QE is big. So um, this is one, this is, I think the main takeaway from the, quant from the quantitative exercise um, that um, conventional policy has a fairly small transmission but QE has uh, internationally, but QE has a large transmission. And this is, in part, is again related to the correlation between the short rates at home and foreign, which makes um, um, kind of uh, <clears throat> um, arbitrageurs uh, um, require a, a, a premium uh, for, let's say, if they, if they are short, let's say, in, um, in home bonds, they also require kind of a comparable negative pre risk premium from foreign bonds because there is a correlation between the these uh, two sets of bonds. So, so anyways, and then QE also has an effect on the exchange rate that is non-negligible. It's about, um, uh, anyway, it's not very large, but it's about 0.3%. Okay, so, um, so if risk aversion is a one quarter as, as big, so it's 10, or every the effects on the yield curve are divided by uh, by four. Okay, so um, that's it. Let me conclude. I'm realize I'm run, uh, kind of my time is up anyway. So um, our goal is to present an integrated framework to un understand risk, um, bond risk premia and um, and currency risk premia, and to tie together the kind of return predictability uh, the way the ways return are predictable in the two markets across the two markets. So this has implications for finance, kind of understand the behavior of this risk premia, but also for macro in terms of the transmission of monetary policy. And uh, some of these extensions actually were, you touched upon uh, from using uh, from in your questions, like for example, that we, there are ways we think to uh, incorporate deviations from CIP. And also ultimately we'd like to embed this into a um, new Keynesian open economy uh, model, kind of have the have, have fuller picture. So let me thank you very much.
for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. So, so I'll I'll ask them while while people may may add to the the Q and A. I was just wondering how this would, if you could adapt the the model for quite large disparities in the sort of importance of the countries, or 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 perhaps allowing for you know if if A is reduced form, allowing for different degrees of uh, frictions to arbitrage in different countries. Uh, the, I wondered if you could adapt it in that in that dimension, because normally the debates are about one large country doing its uh, unconventional, and, and and the effect on maybe some other small countries is quite different characteristics. So I was wondering if you could adapt the model in that dimension. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I think it's a very interesting question. So, um, in fact, yeah, in our, in our calibration, we use the um, uh, moments for the um, US and the eurozone. So we tried, we did our best <laughs> to have as yeah. much symmetry as we could. Right. Uh, so now. Um, in some original version, actually, we had done the US and the, U the UK. So, um, and um, so essentially, so we had to think about the asymmetry a bit more uh, carefully. Now, the way, so there is some uh, flexibility to deal with uh, some aspects of the asymmetry that you mentioned in the model. So, in particular, these um, <clears throat> coefficients of the demand functions, um, we can. Um, um, I mean, the demand functions are expressed in terms of the, uh, of, 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 let's say, the, um, let's say um, the currency of the home country. So if the home country is the US, it's in terms of dollars, but it's, it's total dollars. So essentially, we can assume that if the other country is smaller, we're going to have, we can, um, let's say, um, somehow restrict the, the size of these coefficients to be, let's say, I don't know, according to the, com comparable to the ratios of GDP of the two countries. So that we can we can uh, we have some flexibility there, kind of to make one bond market smaller than the other through the demand functions. Now the other, the, so the, through the parameters of the demand functions. Now the other dimension that you mentioned, which is that the arbitrageurs may have more frictions to trade in some countries than in others. So frictions for arbitrageurs are a bit harder to um, to. Um, um, I mean, we don't have them in this basic model. Essentially, at least, okay, we had, I showed you the segmented case, but we, I really showed you the segmented case because we want to focus on the global arbitrage case. Um, now, um, one way to deal with uh, frictions is to assume, and this actually, our, this other paper that I mentioned by Green with et al, et al does a bit of that, that, some, that more arbitrageurs <coughs> uh, do, let's, let's say, trade, uh, um, Say, let's say <clears throat> bonds and currency than I mean in other words uh, than the trade bonds of the other country in other words there are some global arbitrageurs but not very many and the rest of the arbitrageurs can only trade bonds in uh, I don't know in the US and uh, and uh, and and some of them and some of them can trade currency so I do do kind of a mix of global and segmented arbitrageurs that's one case one possibility the other so but not not in the mod this model that I presented. The other possibility is to have some holding costs. This is something that we are actually thinking, and this also relates a bit to the CIP question that was asked earlier. <clears throat> Essentially to assume that the, there's not only a friction in terms of how much total risk arbitrageurs can bear, but arbitrageurs have a cost also of building positions in different markets. In other words, even if they are, let's say, long short, a position that has like no risk to put, when put together, still they have a cost in terms of their balance sheet to hold this position. And um, which is very realistic, especially kind of given kind of all these uh, changes in bank regulation. And uh, this actually relates very much to the CIP violations. And perhaps also this could speak a bit to your other question about maybe are, are there are limits of arbitrage are bigger for some countries than in others. I have a, another question that's coming from the chat, actually. It's whether or not this can be adapted to, ex to explain things of, that are varying on the in the time dimension, the uh, time varying impacts of QE when it might have had larger effects or, or smaller smaller effects. Uh, and I guess I, I would add a right that whether or not there's feedback from sort of currency moves affecting other intermediaries, but uh, in particular the time variation angle. Okay, cool. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's also a very important question. So. Um, now, <clears throat> as I, I think I said, I mentioned in response to an earlier question, we control the um, kind of the, the extent of limits of arbitrage or the constraints of arbitrageurs through this parameter A, A, which is the risk aversion of arbitrageurs. Now, this is a constant in the model. And uh, 
in some sense, we can look at how, uh, as, as I actually just did in the last slides, at how much, how big, how big is QE transmission when A is large or when A is small. So this is all that we can do in the model in terms of kind of uh, state dependency of kind of QE transmission, kind of whether it, in which case it's larger or small. The, the model would say that it's larger when arbitrages are more const, are, are more risk averse, which is a reduced form for them being more constrained. Now, of course, what it would be uh, fascinating, and I think would be a big step forward in this um, approach, would be to somehow uh, allow for the um, um, risk aversion of arbitrageurs to be explicitly time varying. There has been some work on that in uh, on the finance side, in um, other papers to, uh, but not not kind of integrating this in this whole macro in this whole kind of bond market uh, etc. Picture is just in the context of let's say one asset uh, simple one asset models to allow, let's say, wealth effects of arbitrageurs. So when arbitrageurs lose uh, money, they become more risk averse or they become more financially constrained. So I, I think it would be really interesting to, um, to find a way to, uh, to, to put, put, st stick this into some, into some version of this model. Now, um, so, um, so that we, what we can do here, just as a comparative static exercise, we can do it kind of as part of the stochastic steady state, because this, of course, will generate kind of additional risk premium. Um, kind of the, the, this will become a risk factor effectively the, the change in the wealth of arbitrageurs. But um, anyway, that's that's all that we can do so far. Mm -hmm. well, I've, got, I've got a fairly general question about the predictive power of equilibrium exchange rate models, which is quite a broad question. But I, I, I guess how. <laughs> You know, to what? How much of the predictability can be explained uh, by your model? I'm not sure that's just a question referring back to your uh, your re predictability regressions. But just just to summarise for us, I guess you know, what, how can this enhance the predictive power of our existing models? Perhaps. Oh, uh, okay. So I guess there are okay. There are two questions here. I think I mean two 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 ways one could answer this question. One is whether one can predict. Um, kind of exchange rate move can explain exchange rate movements this kind of exchange rate disconnect and um, the other question is whether one can can uh, account for the predictability for yeah for the for the predictability for the exchange rate predictability findings in other words uh, how much of the not not of actual movements can we explain but how much of the movements in risk premia for exchange rate we, we can explain so uh, um Look, I think the model can speak to both issues in a sense. So, um, this, so how much of the risk premium we can explain? I showed you these graphs, and um, okay. So, I think, I think these are. I, I, I mean, we can exp we can explain at least some of the basic features of the. Yeah. I mean, the the, the the currency carry trade profitability that it goes down with Horizon, etc. Now. For the uh, for the movements of the to explain actual exchange rate movements, of course that's trickier. Now, of course, in our model there is a, this kind of dark matter. There is this gamma factor that is the uh, the kind of variation in the. Let me let me just show it here. This um, here the the gamma, which is the the, the this intercept in in, for, in the currency demand. Now, the, our model is unsatisfactory in the sense it does not say what is driving gamma, but certainly. When we fit the model to the data and uh, try to uh, let's say match all these uh, all these moments here, one of the moments actually is the vari is the variance of the um, of of uh, changes in the um, exchange rates. So we try to explain kind of how big these movements are, and gamma does quite a bit of the work there. So, um, but of course we don't tell you what what is what is the, what are the fundamentals that are driving gamma. Okay, okay. Well, unless there's um, more questions, I think I'll wrap this up on the, pretty much on time. I know people have basically, I'm looking forward to, to chatting uh, later, Dimitri. And thank you, everybody, for coming. We've got a whole sequence of, uh, of speakers in the, in the coming months and uh, look forward to seeing uh, people return. But thank you, Dimitri. It was, it was very interesting. Thank you very much, Rhys. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I will see you shortly on Teams as well. Okay, sounds good. Perfect. Cheers, then. Bye.